Let's take a look at objects and object groups. Objects are named definitions of hosts, uh, and those hosts can be defined either by an individual IP, by a range, by a subnet, as well as a fully qualified domain name. So a lot of times I'll go in and I'll just quickly define my server. Web server, mail server, DNS server, uh, SharePoint, whatever it may be. Maybe there's a source code repository. I'll give meaningful names that let me look at the configuration and know what I'm dealing with. Now, for systems that have got similar rule sets, I've gone through, I've defined all my servers, and let's say those servers are going to have similar rules. I can place the servers that are going to have similar rules inside of an object group. And then when I create my rule, let's say it's an access control list, I'll say permit or deny traffic. And then when I talk about sources and destinations, I'll use these object groups. Now, these object groups can be edited later in time. So let's say six months from now, I come back, I create some more servers, I add some things, I drop those into my object groups. Any access lists, any NAT policies, anything that I've built that references those object groups is now going to inherit that new server that I've added. So it keeps things streamlined and it makes it very, very easy to update in the future and then also keep consistent policies across our systems. Uh, really, really handy. So let's take a look at the deployment of this. Now, starting off, you are going to have service objects that have been defined from Cisco. So these already exist. You don't have to build them, right? But what you will probably wind up building are the network objects. And this is where we just take a name, like DMZ server, mail server, web server, FTP server, and map it to an IP address. Does it have to be one-to-one? -one? No, you could do this quickly. You could say accounting department and just put the subnet of your accounting department. Once you name these, you can use those names inside of your configurations. And again, if you want to make it a bit more scalable, you can nest those objects inside of groups, and then you can even nest groups inside of other groups. Realize that you'll have network objects for systems based on IP address. You'll have service object groups based on the Layer 4 protocol. Things like TCP, UDP, and those are going to be port numbers, of course, and then under ICMP, we can permit or deny individual message types. So I can say, hey, firewall, when you see traffic going from the accountants to the developers, allow these port numbers. Uh, again, we'll take a little bit of time to create all these object groups. But then once those object groups are built, we can drop them into our access list and our NAT configurations. And those are going to look really, really streamlined for us. So a use case for object groups is just doing a quick comparison here. We go, okay, well, I've got a subnet on the inside, 10.3.0.0.16, as well as an individual host outside of that scope, 10.1.1.2. And I want to create a rule that says these devices are allowed to access these particular servers. So here's my destination servers. And notice, based on their IP addresses, we can't easily group these into a range. They're not all part of the same subnet. So they, you know, of course, need to be uh, defined individually. And then up here, we've got our individual services. And they say, if you wanted to create a rule set that encompassed all this and handled it, you'd be looking at about 24 individual lines. Well, if we don't jump into access lists right away, and we took a little bit of time to lay out our object groups, we could make our access list only one line. Uh, let's go forwards and take a look at that next slide. So here we've simplified things. Now there's two steps. Step one is setting up our groups. Step two is using our groups within a configuration. So in this case, we created a group called Inside Sources. Inside Sources includes a subnet as well as an individual host. We've got another group called Outside Servers, just has three individual sources listed by IP. Last but not least, what type of group is this? If these were network, this one is going to be our service. So our service group is called In to Out Service. We named it something meaningful to us. And we're saying we want to go ahead and inspect HTTP, FTP, DNS, and ICMP. And when we inspect ICMP, what we basically do is we see an echo request go through the firewall, and we evaluate it. This is called stateful packet inspection. If one packet goes out, we're going to allow the corresponding packet to come back through. This isn't enabled by default. The ASA does not inspect ping, which means you can send a ping out that's allowed based on your uh, security levels that we talked about earlier. But unfortunately, because it's not being inspected, you're going to send that packet out, 
and the reply is going to come back to your firewall, but it's going to be dropped. Now, if we inspect ICMP, when that uh, ICMP packet goes out, it's a type 8, right? It's an echo request. We see it leave the network. I, it's going to some IP address. I go, well, I expect a type 0, an ICMP echo reply, to come back from that exact same IP address pretty soon. So we basically create an entry in the state table to allow that to return. As soon as that one packet returns, for every packet that goes out, we allow one to return. Once that return comes through, we clear the entry from the state table. Nothing else can come in. A little bit of a side tangent there, uh, but maybe that saves you some time when troubleshooting your ASA. Just the fact that you're like, why isn't ping working? Because you need to add it uh, as an inspection. So look at your class default, add ICMP, ping will work no problem. Uh, again, kind of back to our concept about access control lists here, our ACL is only going to be a single line. You go, really? I went from 24 lines to one? That was easy. Well, you still had to create all these groups in advance, but once you create those groups, they can be leveraged inside of access list, inside of NAT policies, inside of other policies on the firewall, and they're always going to stay consistent with those exact same names. You'll just select them from a drop-down box, and it prevents us from making any type of typos or mistakes. Again, saving us lots of time. So here's an example uh, using the legacy interface, which is ASDM. And what you're seeing here are access control lists. And your access control lists have a source, they've got a destination, and a protocol here. And then, of course, we've got our actions, we've got hit counts, we've got whether or not logging is enabled, if you want to make it time-based, etc. But let's focus on these big ones. Uh, first off, enabled. If you didn't know already, we can enable or disable, by deselecting this checkbox, individual entries. This is fantastic for testing. We can disable uh, an individual entry, test, and then uh, enable it and come back and test again. Now, when we say inside sources, this is an object group. And when you look at your object group, inside sources has got two hosts, the internal host and an internal subnet. But anytime I want to reference those two, I use this name. At any point in the future, I can select inside sources and I can add additional components to it. We see another object group called outside servers. Below, we see a list of those servers that are outside. Notice each one has been defined, external server 123 with an IP address. These are objects, but we put them into an object group so that when I create my access list, I say, when you see inside sources, go to outside servers using these services, we want to permit it. Again, below are our services. These services were already defined from Cisco. We just went in and we put them into a service object group called service groups, and it's into out services. So, here they show some use cases, not with access list, but with network address translation. We've defined a couple different network objects here. Uh, we've got internal subnet, which is, of course, a subnet. We've got DMZ server, which is an individual IP, as well as two other individual IPs. We've got public IP1 and public IP2. The idea is that we want to build a NAT policy that leverages both static and dynamic PAT, or dynamic NAT. Let's talk about those real quick. Static NAT is what we leverage to do a one-to-one -one mapping. If you want to take something public and map it to something private, like a public IP address mapped to an internal server on your DMZ, it's a pretty standard thing to do. You'll use Internet DNS to have a fully qualified domain name resolved to this IP. That brings the user to the outside interface of your firewall. Once they get there, the destination IP will be translated to that of the DMZ server. So one-to-one -one static NAT is what we leverage to provide services to the internet, or under a little bit less common scenario, this is what we could use if we've got internal, maybe uh, users or developers, and we need to guarantee that they'll always get the same IP address every single time they go out. Um, so maybe I've got one policy for, the, for all the users in the business, and then I've got a reserved IP I move certain users onto. That's another reason I could do static, but a little bit different. Um, I'd say the most common usage is providing servers to the internet. Uh, dynamic PAT is also called hide. And this is what you do 
behind your Linksys or your WatchGuard or your Netgear or whatever it is that you got at your house, Asus, uh, Ubiquiti, maybe you've got Cisco ASAs at home. But when we say, here's my Soho router, its default configuration, DHCP on the inside, DHCP on the outside. It pulls an address from your ISP and then pats, port address translation, all the internal users onto that one public address. It's kind of like what we're doing here. But realize we've got those two separate IPs. We've got one for uh, an actual server here. And then we've got dynamic pat. This is port address translation, also known as overload. We're going to take an entire internal subnet and overload it onto that public IP address. So everybody's going to share that IP address when they go out. So one IP address is for my server, the rest is for my users. By leveraging object groups, we cleaned up this configuration a bit, and it would be more meaningful should somebody come along and look at it, um, you know, because we've used these names that are, I think, pretty intuitive. So looking here, we've got a use case uh, for object groups using NAT rules. Let's get through this real quick. Uh, over here, we've got a network object. If you don't have some already or you want to create a new one, we could just hit Add. And it's going to ask you for a name. It's going to ask you for the type. Is this a host? Is it a subnet? Is it a range? Are we talking v4 or v6? Uh, but the real work here is you're mapping that server to this IP address. This is the pairing that we make when we define a network object. Now, NAT is optional. But if you want to build a NAT policy right here, I can say, yeah, I want to add a translation rule. They say what type, static or dynamic? I say, I want to do static. And they go, OK, what should we translate this to? And I say public IP address 1. Remember, that's a network object group. It's a named entity that just contains one particular IP. Now, contrast that to the other side. First, notice that we used a network instead of a host which means now we've got a network mask to go along with that IP address. Our internal subnet refers to 10.3.0.0.16. Fair enough. Now, what we can do is say, I want to perform address translation for all those users. It's going to allow them to get to the internet. We say, what type of address translation? Dynamic PAT. And that word hide is in parentheses. This is just because we're multiplexing lots and lots of users all sharing that one single IP address. So I hope this was useful. Two different examples of how object groups can make your life a tad easier.